welcome welcome back to ABG's Top 5. My name is Seb and in today's episode of Top 5, we'll finish up the journey that we have started multiple weeks back when we started in the 90s. So if you haven't caught up with this series, uh, the links to the Top 5 games of the 90s, uh, 2000s and the first half of 2010s can be found in the description box below. So you can check it out below for the, uh, for the videos from the era. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to us, please do click on the button at the bottom right hand corner of the screen and click on the notification bell so you get uh, our videos as soon as they're out. So continuing on in 2015, this is probably the most familiar time zone for all of us as this is just literally the last five years. And given COVID-19, most people haven't even started 2020 even though we are kind of like in the last quarter of the year. So yeah, and uh, in, in, in this last or in this uh, last series of this uh, era, uh, I think this is where Asian games have started to gain a, a, a real foothold uh, in board games. And especially during the second half of the decade, more and more designers are actually coming up uh, and more so Asian publishers are also out there in the market trying to start uh, or trying to make this business a viable business. And if we haven't mentioned this before, uh, in 2010s, there are actually 85 titles in the current BGG Top 5, uh, sorry, the, the current BGG Top 100, and only 12 from uh, the decade before, and two from the 90s. So with that said, uh, let's just head straight into the games. Uh, and with me, I have three lovely guests as always. Uh, two of them you have seen throughout the entire series. And one, you probably will find him familiar uh, on YouTube and in our previous video. So first we have uh, Jeffrey, our top five recurring guest. You see him in every episode of top five. Hi. For Matthew, he is obviously our top five recurring era guest from 90s to 2000s to 2010s. And he's, he's around throughout uh, the, the series. And yeah. for Elliot, which, uh, has been around since 2010. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Just in the just in the last video. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we, we wanted to have a bit of familiarity in the decade, given that it was supposed to be one video to begin with, but we kind of split it up because there are too many games in 2010s, um, so to speak. Good call, so, good call. Yeah. So I mean, without further ado, let's head straight in with 2015. So in 2015, uh, we have quite a number of entries uh, and we'll start off with Elliot's 2015. Okay, cool. Uh, so the first game that I picked is something which I always recommend to, uh, whether it's like a party or whether or not it's just a bunch of friends who are you know drinking wine with me at home. Uh, and I play quite a fair bit with my family actually because my family size isn't huge. It's like uh, six of us who are living in this current house. So uh, my title is uh, Codenames. So it's very fun, very easy to teach. It's very good for family bonding because you will end up bickering, you will end up like just like laughing, shouting, everything with each other. Uh, so generally what it is, it's almost like a game, uh, as, as the name suggests, it's a game of you trying to hint towards other players without saying the thing itself. Think of it like an evolved version of, like I see it as an evolved version of uh, a game like Taboo, right? You're split into two teams, and the objective of, of uh, there's a person who gives the code uh, and knows like the answer key and he needs his fellow teammates uh, to pick out the right words on the table. It's just, it's just grid. Lah. It's a, a, I think a 4 by 4 uh, no, a 5 by 5 grid on the table. Yeah. And each of them have like different coloured words. Now, the trick here is that some words are for the red team and some words are for the blue team, depending on which team you're on. There are squares that are blanks, so that means you can't score points if your teammates choose that particular word. Um, and there's one one very special square, the black square, that if you pick it, your team instantly, yeah, it's, it's, it's a loss for you. Lah. So the idea is you must never ever say or never ever suggest and hint towards your teammates to pick the black one. Uh, think about it this way, it's a good game to test your vocabulary 
and to test like, the idea of synonyms and the power of suggestion. There are a lot of games that came out in this in this particular decade, things like Mysterium, uh, uh, which I also really much enjoy, where it's all about mind reading and trying to understand personality, but there's an educational component, and, and that's why I really, really enjoy uh, my pick for this year, 2015, code names. Right, so I think we... I'm, I'm surprised we don't actually have a crossover. Nice! Code yeah. names yeah. in Jeffrey's top five games under 30 minutes. And... Link is up there somewhere. You can actually find it. I'm gonna to link to the video of top five games under 30 minutes. If you want a quick game, do catch that video. And Code Names definitely is a game that you can play in a quick time, mm-hmm. as quick as someone finding the Spy Master. Yeah, yeah. You just find the Spy Master. The the cool thing about Code Names, I think, across the years, is that they made a lot of different spin-off versions as well. So if there is a particular theme that you're interested in, you can always uh, try to procure a version. Like I think there's a Marvel one that's floating around now. So pretty solid. Pictures, that's Marvel. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, it's really fun. Really easy. Hmm. All right. So let's head straight to uh, Jeffrey's 2015 pick. He didn't pick code names. So let's guess what it is. All right. Okay. So my 2015 pick is one of my favorite power placement games. Uh, that will be Out of Sky. So for Out of Sky, uh, the rule is simple. Okay. Each round, players will have the auction two tiles okay and then uh, in turn base each player will also get to purchase um, one one of the other players tile all right so after that one round okay if nobody buys your tile you get to spend it yourself and then you start placing tiles and each round you get to earn points according to the objective stated at the center board Alright, so the end of the game, whoever got the most points win. So what I like about this game right, is there is replayability, especially the objectives to score points. So you know that uh, you can have you know some challenging ones, uh, you can have some uh, easier ones along the game. Yeah. So so it makes it also allows you to plan ahead. For example, you know round one you score it this way, round two you score it the other way, and you can actually see how it is scored for the future rounds. That's that's why you can actually plan it ahead. Uh, and make good decisions according to which um, house you want to buy or which kids, uh, which house do you want to purchase it yourself and therefore you have to offer a higher price so that you know um, you deter people from buying a town. So there are some strategies, there are some there are some replayability and there are a lot of considerations according to you know um, various situations, uh, you know that crucial town you want etc. And in the other videos uh, I do recommend the the expansions as well yeah so uh i do recommend start with the base game and then get the expansion all right it is still available online so if you're uh if you're interested in this game you know uh, why not get the base and expansion together yeah so that's my 2015 pick out of sky and next up we'll be moving on to matthew's double pick for 20 years <laughs> well you have two picks uh. that's, that's awesome yeah i've got two picks so nice. the first was something that I mentioned uh, for top 5 games under 30 minutes. Uh, the game is called Stir Fire 18. Uh, just a quick recap. Uh, the game only consists of 18 cards. right? Uh, and in the game, basically everybody are chefs and they are trying to basically cook dishes. So during your turn, you basically have a set of cards. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to discard cards to actually gain more cards so you can uh, create the most expensive or rather the dish that gives you the most number of points. Now, uh, there are a few conditions. So number one, uh, when discarding cards, you either need to discard pairs or you need to discard a special ingredient. So the special ingredient if I'm correct is pork, chicken or prawns, right? Uh, the other thing is that when you are actually cooking dishes, you, you must have anywhere between three to five cards. They must be unique and they must at least have noodles. So there's kind of like a lot of strategies in terms of how you either discard cards or how you actually form your hand, right? Um, as like any bluffing game, uh, you can actually lie about what you discard. <laughs> so, and when people catch you correctly, you know, the person who lies, you know, they lose penalty. Um, but whoever catches wrongly, they also have some form of penalty as well. Again, love it um, because of its bluffing elements and yeah. That's my first entry for 2015, uh, Starfire 18. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, and the second entry is called Mafia de Cuba. So in this game, um, as the name suggests, basically everybody is all like part of the Mafia and there's the Godfather. So what happens is that the Godfather actually has a box and he actually goes around uh, the different people to pick out whatever there is inside the box. So inside the box, there can be chips and there can be uh, jewels as well. Um, as the so one of the rules that when it's your turn, when you receive the box, you either can take jewels, which means you are siding with the evil side who is against the godfather, right? Or you can actually pick out uh, chips. So the chips basically contains rules uh, for players to adopt. So maybe like for example, they are the mafia's henchmen, they can be the police and I, if I'm correct, there's also a taxi driver. And once everything is passed around, and it comes back to the Godfather. The Godfather will see, oh no, there's all these things that are, have gone missing. And what he needs to do is because his jewels have actually been circulated around, he needs to communicate with everybody in the game, you know, such that he's able to point out who are the people who are against the Godfather and to actually retrieve back the jewels. So after the first round where everything is being passed around, uh, there will be a lot of, um, in Singapore context, we like call it as talking cock. <laughs> but um, most people would, um, as, um, would associate it more towards bantering, you know, they are just, you know, trying to um, just talk it out with each other to kind of weed out who are the, like, the evil guys and stuff. So again, it's quite a communicative game and yeah, that's my second entry, um, Mafia de Cuba. This game sounds really good, actually. I, I, I've, I've heard about it before, but it seems like there's a lot of mind games that you can play along with this Yeah, one. yeah, exactly, exactly. So, that's why. Uh, second game for 2015, Mafia de Cuba. Yep, so, if you don't already know, Matthew is our resident mind games. Yeah, he's a Jedi mind trick specialist. <laughs> Worth playing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Wait till you see the other three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Yeah. In that case, let's not uh, talk cock any further and move straight oh, to yeah? Yeah. the next year. Yeah, twenty sixteen, where you find yeah. it's, a re- it's kind of like a recurring theme where you hear one from Elliot, one from Jeffrey, and two from Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, that like a deja vu and deja vu. Yeah, it's, a, it's another one. Uh, so I, I guess I'm going first. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my pick. For 2016, actually I had quite a number of things but I hunkered down and I decided I'm going to pick Aeon's End as my pick for 2016. Now, there, there are many other variations of Aeon's End and other, like even a legacy version that came out quite recently. Uh, but the original Aeon's End has a very special place in my heart. Uh, it's one of the few times that you actually get to fight all these like crazy monsters. You're going to play a very unique characters and it is a engine builder the same thing um, as you know some of the other games that I'll talk about later on as well uh, and competed with quite a number of titles that we've chosen uh, within this half of the decade uh, but Aeon's End what happens is that you and uh, up to another three players play uh, majors and you're defending this city uh, this underground city called Gravehold from like, extra the rest they all look like monsters from some sort of like Cthulian nightmare uh, look a bit alien versus predator-ish as well. Um, the cool part about this game really is that uh, there is a very special turn-based system where it's pretty much variable. You never you never know who's going to take the next turn at the end of a cycle because of this uh, initiative order cards. Uh, I think this is really great for teaching people and you know it keeps people active and, and thinking way ahead because it's not like okay I know I have three turns still it's still it's me and or whatnot, you are always kind of kept on your toes and you really have to plan ahead. In some uh, like drafting and engine builder games, the problem is that because things are so predictable, uh, you sort of like have a, have a long-term plan in mind, but not in Aeon's End. Uh, in Aeon's End, things can surprise you out of nowhere and uh, because of that, what you build and how you, you create your engine uh, really can be quite exciting. They have a marketplace and an app that kind of... Uh, you can use on your phone to randomize this marketplace and what you choose in your games. So the replayability and every time you... It almost gives you this like roguelike element that you see on like video games these days. But really back in the day where you can... Um, 
I guess from the tabletop perspective, this was pretty much unheard of. Um, also, the theme is just very cool. Like you play majors from all sorts of areas, and uh, because the action economy is so important, uh, you really feel like you're in control. When you when you make a mistake in the game, you're very much gonna remember that you made that mistake, and the next playthrough against a harder boss, um, and there are quite a few number of bosses you can you can find in it. It really keeps you coming back for more, trying new uh, play styles. The, the, the fun and I guess frustrating part is that you are reliant on your teammates, right? This is a cooperative game and there's no like, who was the best hero? You just want to win the game and it's, it's no easy feat. Uh, but that can also make for some frustrating times when if you have a player who's really, really bad or he doesn't really understand how things can like synergize and click together, then you find yourself at a bit of a disadvantage. But nonetheless, uh, in the late 20, I mean like 2015 all the way to 2019, there were a lot of very good cooperative games that came out and this is definitely one of my favorites. So if you guys are thinking of trying something that's a bit, it's not super duper heavy uh, compared to some of the other titles I'm going to show later, but certainly enough for new players and uh, people who have some experience on tabletop to really get into the themes of it. So that's my pick for 2016, Aeon's End. So let's move to Jeffrey's 2016 pick. All right, my 2016 pick is about a merchant in the Meiji era trying to, you know, do a successful business. Okay, <laughs> this game is called Yokohama. Yeah. Okay, and this game, right, is a little bit heavier. So, uh, I'm going to talk about just a few parts of the game mechanics and then I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I like it so much. So, um, at the center of the table, you will place, you know, this action house uh, according to, uh, I mean, it's quite similar to a pyramid and then each player's turn, right, you'll get to Play, uh, put one assistant in three different areas or two assistants in one area and from there okay you move something called president to the areas where you have at least you know an assistant okay so after that you will get to um, perform some action according to you know the area that you activated in okay and along the way right you can get to earn I mean you can get to fulfill contracts uh, complete achievements, you know, you can also have this foreign minister to help you perform an extra action. Yeah, so there are, what I like about this game right, is there are many, many ways right, to earn points. Yeah, so you know, it can be contracts, it can be so many, something else, you know, you can also earn points by building, uh, I think, building shops, uh, you can go to church and, 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 and earn points from it, uh, etc. Yeah, so, so, the reason why I, I'm interested in this game is right, because I have this impression that it, it is quite similar to Istanbul, which is one of my, another of my favorite games. Yeah. And upon my experience, it's actually quite uh, it, it is similar, but there are some differences. And I experienced the game in a whole in, in a whole new different level. Yeah. So this is one of the Yeah, so in a way this is uh, although this is like a modular board, uh, it's a modular board game. Okay, yeah. And there are some, you know, um, building involved yeah but i find that you know this is a good planning game also a good planning a game and it is also it, it is also very exciting to play with your opponents yeah, because you know they are also uh, you know doing their best to earn as many points and you know they are basically fighting uh, in a way to score the most points yeah so it's it's a good planning game although it's maybe it's good planning game and it's quite exciting to play so i enjoy this game a lot so that's my 2016 pick yokohama so the, the components for this game are actually very pretty. I I, remember I played Yokohama some, some time back and the, it had some really cute meeples. I think the art and the, the tokens are all very nice very yeah. nice to, to, to <laughs> fiddle around with. So Yeah. And this is the first Asian game. Yokohama. Mm. Yes. Among among the least so far. Nice, nice, mm. nice. Yeah, this is my first yeah, this is our first Asian game. Yashi yeah. Yashi. Mm. Alright. Next up we'll get Matthew to Share his double pick again. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, last because after this you won't hear so much from Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So the first of the twenty sixteen games, right? That I actually have. Uh, the first is actually called Not Alone. So what happened in this game? Uh, it's uh. Okay. So basically, the good guys is basically everybody else, and the bad guy is just one person. Right, so it's uh, basically aliens trying to uh, destroy human life form, you know, as they are traveling towards their planet. So what happens in the game is that um, 
in the center of the map, there's basically five different locations in which the humans can travel. And basically the humans, they can travel to whichever uh, of the locations they want, uh, that they can go. But what they are trying to do is because the alien is also trying to go to any of these places to actually uh, reduce the health of humans, you know, as, as they go to their area. So uh, again, the mind games comes from, you know, the alien is trying to guess where the humans are and the humans are actually trying to fool where the aliens is. So uh, as the game progresses, there are certain locations which allows you to actually gain, uh, to have access to other locations as well. So the starting locations you have is five, but the total area is 10. Yeah. And in each of the different areas, there is basically a lot of abilities, um, Humans, they will also have like special cards in which they, they can play against the alien. The alien, every round, he has also special cards in which they can use against the human. And basically, it's just a little race to see uh, which side wins in general. Uh, again, I've already explained about the mind games component. So, yeah, that's the first, uh, which is not alone. Yeah, and I played this with Matthew on <laughs> What are your thoughts about the game? Well, I bought the game, so... <gasps> so you bought it? <laughs> yeah, I bought the game. Nice! I mean, it's, it's, it's a game that... I, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not in my pick yet because I haven't played it enough to choose it as a, as a top 5 favorite game, but uh, I think it plays well at various player counts. Mm. Yeah, so, and, and for a game that is this size, which you can see from my face and, and how big this box is. You can play up to seven players and it's not... And, and it has the deep gameplay. So I think mm. it's a really good game, not just for the mind elements of the mind, the thinking elements of it, but more of the fact that it's, it's, it's kind of like a... I don't know how to describe it. It's... it's, it's I don't like horror theme, but I, I bought it. So... <laughs> Seems like the kind of stuff I might be interested in. I, I might take a take a gander at it. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. So, I mean, it's I, I feel I feel that it's it's it's, it's really a good game. We played it I think three times. Yeah. Be, yeah. Before we knocked off for the night. Yeah, and I it decided was, to buy it after the trip. It, it was fun stuff, uh. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's a good game. Uh. It's really a good. Mm. Game. Okay. So the second game will be a game that is familiar to most. Uh, the game is called Secret Hitler. Yeah. Mm. So as like any social deduction game, uh, basically there's the good guys and the bad guys. Um, and so in, in the game, how um, so after they know their rules, right? So basically there'll be like the president and there will be the chancellor. So the so everybody takes us to be the presidents, by the way. So the president uh, will basically appoint a chancellor. So basically, um, what the chancellor does is they will have like three different uh, bills to pass. Some are good, some are bad. So uh, the president takes, chooses one to discard out the three and then the chancellor does the same thing as in discards one and whatever that's left is being passed. So like choosing a chancellor is very important and therefore everybody goes into a vote. So eventually everybody will keep doing this until either side actually meets their objective. Um, now, because this is a game that most of you know how to play, so won't really elaborate too much. Again, the mind games come from trying to figure out who is like the good guys and who is the bad guys, and try to figure out the intentions of what other people are doing. Uh, another thing to note is sometimes there may be situations where, you know, maybe uh, the bad guys receive three positive, uh, good bills. You know, they're helping the good guys. So, you know, they have no choice. And then, of course, vice versa. There can be three bad bills, which the good guys will be like, oh, you know, I actually, I, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, again, quite mind gamey. Uh, Secret Hitler 2016. Oh, I really like Secret Hitler. I mean, it's, it's an easy enough game to bring out and like share with friends. And uh, when you mentioned the, the board game, the, the, this, this game to people who don't really, you know, enjoy our hobby as much. Like they they hear the word Hitler, right? They get very scared. But like once they play, it's like oh, there's a crocodile. It's, it's chill. Yeah, it's not really like Hitler, Hitler. So yeah. Hey, okay, so let's move on to my first two games of the of this era. Yeah. And uh, I have two picks in 2016, and the first of my uh two picks, 
Uh, it's a game that uh, I think most people would know because they won international awards for it. And the first game is King Domino. So in King Domino, basically you are a lord seeking new land and you're trying to expand your kingdom. And you start off with this little, nice, cute little uh, king-looking meeple on, on one tile. And essentially, it's a tile placement game such that you actually uh, take tiles and you actually expand your territory, scoring points that way. Uh, one aspect I, I really like about the game is the fact that if you actually choose uh, stronger tiles, which are usually the tiles with the higher numbers, you actually will be disadvantaged when you select your next tile because the, the mechanism of the tile selection comes in the form of if you actually pick the lower number, you essentially will get your tile first and you can actually have your pick on the next kind of four tiles on the on, on, on table uh, when you actually see them coming up because you actually go first in terms of uh, placing your your other uh, king maple to actually collect the tiles in. So in, in the, the game itself, you actually win by scoring the most points and points are not just simply uh, connecting the dominoes, you actually have to connect dominoes with crowns on them. So it's, it's like a multiplier in terms of how many crowns you have in a connected area of, let's say, uh, forest or uh, wheatland or the ocean. And with that, you can actually then score the amount of points. And if you actually manage to put it in a exact 5x5 five five, uh, situation, because there are rules on how you can actually place the dominoes in, you have to match one element to the other where the middle, uh, the original tile that you start off with is like a joker tile. So there are there, there will be occurrence that you can't actually fit in nicely in a 5x5. Five five. So if you manage to do that, you score bonus points. And if you manage to put your kingdom tile in the middle, you also score bonus points. So it's, it's, it's the kind of game that is simple to teach, uh, yet it's fun and deep and you will keep going at it again and again. So yeah, that's my first 2016 pick, King Domino. And if you recall, if you if you have been a long term follower of this series, uh, Jeffrey actually recommended the expansion, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you can get the expansion together with the game because I think it's a good game. And personally, to me, I think Queen Domino is also somewhat like an expansion to the game because you can play them together in a royal managed version where you can play up to eight players uh, with with both copies together. So that's my first pick, King Domino. And I'll move on to my second. So the second pick uh, that I have for 2016 uh, is a game that has already been mentioned in uh, another video. Not here, there's no crossover task far. So it's, it's, it's from the top 5 games under 30 minutes and Steve was the one who mentioned it. And the game is Santorini. So in Santorini, it's kind of like a chess-like game where you actually have two workers on a, on a board and you're, you're moving around and each turn you essentially move and build, move and build. And how to win the game is you actually have to reach level three on the uh, on the on, on kind of like the, the playing board that you're on. Yeah. If you have been to Greece, if you have been to Santorini, have you seen the beautiful blue domes? In this game, it's kind of like a bummer because the blue domes actually act as a blockage to you winning the game. Because uh, any player can actually go to a level three uh, building and put the dome on, and thus nobody can actually move there. So the game is also deepened by the fact that there are variable player powers where you can actually uh, take different, I think they call them gods or lords and you literally, in, in, in the team of Greek gods, you actually have different power that's related to what they are, like zoos and all that. So that actually deepens the gameplay and, and adds the replayability to a game that if you want to play in a basic mode to teach, you could even play it without the powers because it itself, it's a, it's a very good uh, abstract kind of game where you actually move and you actually kind of try to reach level 3 in the gameplay. There's one way to lose and that is if you can't move any of your workers anymore where you're stuck. Because for you to move, you actually can only move adjacent tiles or you can move up an adjacent tile that is of one level higher than where you're on. So the base level is like level 0, 1, 2, 3. And then when you reach the dome, you, you, can't, you can't step onto the dome. So most of the game, you will be trying to attack and then defend when you try to actually block your your opponent from winning. The game technically plays two to four, but to be honest, I think it's best played two or four, like four in, in terms of two teams of two. Yeah, so that's my other game from 2016, Santorini. Santorini is great, man. I think it's one, probably one of the most uh, 
it's it's actually quite relaxing uh, as a game if you ask me yeah it's it's easy to watch and uh, still very fun like when other people are moving their things you're, you're always actively engaged in the board state so really really helpful yeah, it's the kind of game that's fun even for audience. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's fun to watch as well. You, you just sit by and you watch and you're like, what the hell is happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one is actually quite easy to follow. Yeah. yeah you can follow at any... Any point in the game, actually. At any yeah. point in time and you can actually still continue mm-hmm. understanding the game and, and try to actually follow the game to the end. Yeah, and with that, I have come to the end of... Tw- we have come to the end of 2016 and we move on to 2017. And for 2017, we have two, two double entries from both Elliot and Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. So we'll let Elliot start off first. I suspect, I smell crossover, but... <laughs> I don't maybe, maybe. Yeah. maybe. Okay, uh, I well, I have one really heavy one and one really light one. So I'll start with the one that I think is slightly lighter first, uh, which is one of my favourites. I still play it very often with, uh, with my wife. It's called Azul. So... Azul is very it's it's very beautiful game because you have to uh, pick a bunch of tiles from a centerpiece and you're basically trying to build uh, like decorative tiles as like a little pattern. Uh, but the the trick is that you know it's obviously a, a small a small pool that you pick for and you're trying to just pick these supplies. Uh, if you can build things nicely according to the rules, then great, you score a bunch of points. But there are a lot of times when you can kind of like sabotage people and then they, they have to pick things which are unfavorable. These wasted supplies convert into uh, you losing points or it harms your score, uh, generally speaking. Now, this game is very easy to teach people. Um, it's also very, very cute because all the colors are very nice and bright. There are, actually, there's another title in, in this year which I had to kind of like flip flop around uh, with. But uh, Azul was the, the, the pick that I went for in terms of something that's aesthetically very beautiful. But gameplay wise, also, I think can be quite in depth the more you play with other, uh, with other people, right? The first time you play it, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, as with most of these kind of like drafting games. Um, but everything kind of makes sense in Azul to me. And, and that's the beauty of, of such a game. Uh, it's not weighted very high. The box isn't like tremendously huge. Uh, but it's something which can kind of like doing yoga, you can really just play and, and chill. There's no fighting because it's not like a dexterous game or whatever. It's, it's you trying to build something uh, in front patterns-wise. And even if you don't score points, right, it still looks really great. Like whatever's in front of you just looks really great. Uh, I, I can't recommend it enough for people who want to try something a little bit more um, casual, so to speak, but you will start to develop like mental faculties to tackle uh, this genre of games. So this is a good entry point, if you ask me. And that's my first pick for 2017 called Azul. Only yeah. one problem yeah. with Azul. For Azul, right, uh, to me, right, this is... Uh, okay, to me, Azul, right, is a good game to sabotage others for yeah. some reason. Okay, the, 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 the best way to sabotage others is to have leftovers. Yeah, a leftovers. lot of leftovers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, and if I want to shout out uh, two more games for Azul, right, is uh, the, the second version of Azul, or second game, the second title called the uh, Stainted Glass of Sintra. Okay, and then there's a third title called the Summer Pavilion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I've played all the Azul versions before, and I also highly recommend the other two as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sam, what was the issue you had with uh, with Azul? I mean, coming from Singapore, the, 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 the main problem I have with Azul is the starting player is the last player who had been to Portugal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the rules. Okay, the I mean, if, if you're from that part of the world, fine, you are. Portugal is like next to your country yeah. and it's like it's a neighboring country. Mm-hmm. You can probably get on a, a, a cheap flight and, and fly there and you've been to Portugal. <laughs> but from Singapore, it's impossible. Portugal is way, way far away. <laughs> so far. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's probably only direct flights maybe to Lisbon, I think. I don't know. Maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I've never been there myself, but uh, I've been wanting to go for a long while. Yeah, so uh, if yeah. none of us have been to Portugal, who starts first? No, I'm just... just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was, my, that was my first pick. Uh, my second pick is a lot heavier. In fact, probably one of the heaviest games I've, I've, I've played, but I, I still want to continue playing. Okay, so just disclaimer, I don't have a copy of this game anymore kind of gave it away which I'm very upset about but uh, it's a game called Too Many Bones I don't know if you guys have heard of Too Many Bones um, 
it's it's really a massive a massive undertaking. It's not cheap, and I can't really find a copy of it anymore. Uh, but it's a it's pretty quite a special genre to me. It's like a dice builder RPG. Uh, now, to explain the essence of what Too Many Bones is, it's like an action adventure thing where you and your friends are going up uh, on, on, a, on a series of tasks so that you can fight against like this uh, evil tyrant. Uh, kind of like Aeon's End, but extremely complicated. Uh, what you're going to do is that there are almost like a hundred plus like unique dice in this set, which are skill dice, and you're going to be building your character according to um, the tasks at hand. Now, that seems like, you know, you could just have replaced it with cards, right? Well, no. Uh, there are so many variations of how you want to play this and it's not uh, a straightforward, like, uh, this is the optimal path because there are things like luck and chance that, as with a lot of dice games, the reason why they're dice is because there must be an element of, uh, of risk and reward involved. Uh, one thing I like about this is that it's very flavorful. I think all the bad guys and, like, um, there are little narrative components in the game. So if you're into really, like, the role-playing aspects, uh, it can be quite immersive if that's your kind of thing. Um, and these storylines that occur throughout your gameplay actually have consequences. So they're usually related to like acquiring skill dice or you know losing uh, skill dice or you know having little setbacks. End of the day, there's just so many components, so it can be quite intimidating for some. And the game itself. Minimally, I think for me, it usually lasts about anywhere between like 70 to 80 minutes. Lah. So it's not something you're just going to pop out. You're going to need like friends who are willing to clear the entire... It's not a legacy style game, uh, but you definitely have to commit to playing with every single variation because they all have uh, quite quite unique builds. In fact, the characters that are provided in the base set, um, they really play very differently. Like you can actually... The, the, the game board for each character... Uh, is quite unique. They have little dice slots for you to put in and then they have like little leveling up paths as well. Uh, I, I enjoy it because, you know, me and my friends, when you're thinking of playing RPGs in this day and age, it can be quite tiring. Like I play a lot of D&D and that requires a lot of time commitment. Think of this as a shortened down like dungeon crawler where you can kind of like knock it out in an in a afternoon, or maybe like two or three of, or three of these. Uh, so yeah, that is my 2017 pick. Uh, called Too Many Bones. I'm going to volunteer myself to play with you, but you mentioned you don't have a copy of it. Yet. Yeah, no, I, I gave my copy away to a friend who is in the States, and you know, they, they, they haven't been back for like the past five years. Yeah. <laughs> so... And the funny thing is, they probably can get a copy of it easier. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what irks me the most. They played it at my place and they were like, hey, I really, really like this game. Do you mind if I, if I borrow it for a while? And I said, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And it never came back, so. But the, the way you describe it actually reminds me of another game that is even simpler. Oh, really? Dice okay, okay. I mean, it's, it's simpler. Oh, Dice Forge, right? Dice Forge, right? It's, it's, it's a totally yeah. different, different format. Right, right, right. But right. yeah, it's very similar uh, feels in the sense of like, you know, dice matter. And because there's so many unique dice, right? Buying the game itself, you will just have uh, so many things to look at and play with. That's, that's always interesting. Yeah. I mean, the, the graphics, the, the dice itself looks great. Oh yeah, the dice are, are amazing. I think it's probably worth yeah, it's probably worth whatever you pay for it. It's it's a high price point. I think I got it back then for like maybe two hundred bucks or something. Yeah. Yeah, not cheap, but it was worth it. Game. It's expensive, but it was really, really worth it. Alright. And speaking about expensive games, one of us know about expensive games a lot because most of his games are not cheap, and that is Jeffrey. <laughs> and let's move on to Jeffrey's double pick. <laughs> Alright, so uh, I'll start with one of my favorite games. Okay, it is uh, one of, uh, I recommended this as one of the games uh, aspiring for game designers to play. Okay, and this game is called Enter Maria. Yeah, so what, one reason why I like this game uh, is is a good use of dice to, to you know, just one use of dice that you can do multiple actions. Okay, and this multiple actions like right, varies according to how you place, do your tile placement at your own player board. So it's very simple, just take a dice and then you get to uh, perform actions according to the vertical um, movement of, I mean, vertical placement of the tiles in your, on, on your player board or the horizontal one. Yeah, so, so uh, along the way, right, you can actually um, find many ways to earn uh, 
some points, okay, to, um, yeah, so so it all depends on how are you going to uh, do the tile placement, yeah, so you can actually have multiple ways to to earn points, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, you can actually watch uh, the earlier video, I've actually explained quite a lot of um, the, the, uh, the components in in uh, in the earlier video so probably i'll just cut short the point when i maybe uh, explain you know um uh you can actually you know um, um produce resources you know you can actually improve your religious power you know recruit monks um you can you know actually um um, you know, score points according to how you place your house, etc. Yeah, so there's many ways to 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 uh, earn points. Yeah, so that's one reason why I like this game a lot. Yeah, and and I do recommend it to I do recommend everyone to get a copy before it uh, is out of print. Yeah, so that's all my pick, Santa Maria. Okay, I really like Santa oh. Maria. Santa Maria is really good actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it is very yeah. good. Yeah, and I'm quite surprised that it isn't as popular as I, as I expected. Yeah. yeah. So, you, you you mentioned that it's good for like aspiring board game designers, right? And I can really attest to that. It it has so many different elements of design uh that are involved, especially with uh yeah, the fact that they're using dice, so there's some level of probability here, but it, it just very efficiently plays out. I think the game's only like three rounds, right? So it really does uh the gameplay for for a game of this depth, it doesn't take very long. Yeah. Yeah, and another reason, and then I another reason why I recommend this for a spy game designer is basically to show like you know there are there are many interesting ways like okay to use a dice. Yeah, yeah. and never a dice right okay you can do so many actions and you thought they just roll a dice okay you just roll and that's it. Yeah. no not really man okay yeah mm -hmm. there are many creative ways and this is one of the one of the creative board game I I, I played yeah so I recommend this and this is still one of my top favorites. Yeah. Okay, so I'll recommend my next 2017 game. Okay, um, it has a very distinctive cover. Okay, it, at, at first glance, I think it's a very ugly cover, but the more you look at it, more it, I feel it's cute. La. So, um, the box cover shows a cartoon version of an alpaca, and this game is called Altiplano. Yes, so this game, right, is uh, quite an interesting back building game. I'm not saying deck building game is a back building game which means that okay you will get to uh, you know draw tiles from a deck yeah etc okay so uh, it is quite a complicated game to explain so so at each player's turn right you will get to move up to three steps uh, within various uh, building or action tiles okay and once you land on the tile you just do an action some of the actions is you get resources some of the actions is you get to you know uh, complete um, I mean get some tiles you get to complete some let's say contracts yeah I can't know what it's called yeah so basically is you know do production um, um, able to fulfill orders yeah all right yeah and and along the way okay uh, whoever got the most I think most money wins yeah so what I like about this game right is is as usual, okay, there are still many ways to win, okay, and and each player has have a unique character that you know give you a head start that you know you you are able to produce more of this um, resource. Yeah. So so um, yeah, it is something that uh, I do recommend and the and the packaging design or I mean the, the component design of the game I find it very as well yeah so the first player marker is a jigsaw puzzle a simple jigsaw puzzle of uh, alpaca yeah and uh, yeah so so do try it out yeah and and because it is quite a complex game right yeah i do recommend uh players who want to start this game i read the rules a lot more earlier yeah when you table this game yeah so uh that'll be my 26 17 pick lt plano all right I was starting to think that 2017 kind of have a lot of plasticky components being shown out there with dices and and, and I mean like Azus you have tiles. It's, it's kind of like the, the year where a lot of this I mean we, we're moving kind of into a, a lot of plastic era where in a, in a way it hurts the environment but Actually that's true, uh, that's true. A lot more like, like 
games that were I mean they're not miniatures games but like there are a lot of miniature type things going on in some of the other games which are from 2017-ish that I shortlisted but you know it didn't really come through in the end I think it's probably attributed to when the first the first personal available 3D printer is available for designers oh that makes sense yeah that makes sense it's mm-hmm. hard to test out components in a game because That's when true. in the past you can't actually readily get them so a lot of designers don't actually make 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 uh, prototypes with, with that. So, I yeah, don't know. That's true. That's, true. That could, know. that's, that's, that's a, a good theory. That's a good theory. Yeah. So, what is your theory? If you have a theory, share with us below and let's think about why 2017 is kind of like the rise of the plastic in a way <laughs> or minis, so to speak. But let's move on to 2018. And in 2018, we will start off with... Uh, we have three picks actually uh, in 2018, uh, Elliot, Jeffrey and myself. And you haven't heard from Matthew in a while, but he's going to share in 2019. So he's not forgotten, he hasn't, <laughs> he hasn't like rocked off in a corner. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so this is my, I think this should be my final pick for this entire series. Um, the one that I picked last is actually also a pretty heavy game. Surprisingly, usually I'm not into um, super heavy games, but uh, the ones I picked so far, I think, especially in this past five years, uh, the thematics of it usually are very cool, and some of the gameplay mechanics also, I think, are uh, something like break the mold, and it kind of shapes what we think as like modernly developed uh, tabletop games. Mm. So my 2018 pick is called Root. Okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, I absolutely love Root. Uh, I mean, the base game itself is for two to four players, but I, I think, and I haven't played the expansion yet, but I heard the expansion, you can kind of play like solo and it increases the player count to up to six. Uh, what, is, what is Root? Root is kind of like, I, I kind of think of it as uh, like open warfare, but asymmetrical. So it's very interesting how the game works. You pick a faction and you have your own kind of like win conditions and your own abilities as you span across your forces around this beautiful like woodland map. Okay, uh, there are different and all the, all the guys are drawn in this very um, like old school uh, like children's book cartoon style uh, of art. So the art is great. The meeples are wonderful because they're very thematic to woodland creatures. Uh, they're all different shapes and sizes and um, this game is pretty pretty heavy because each game usually lasts me anywhere between like um, maybe like 70 to 90 minutes every single time and the rules of the game are, are not that direct as well because I kind of mentioned it's asymmetrical and once you have like more than let's asymmetrically one in what like one in two players like that's okay. Imagine if like four people are playing an asymmetrical game where all of us have different win conditions. Uh, we're sharing the same board state, so it's not like we're drafting and, and being isolated. No, we're always reacting to other players and the kind of things that they can do. The get the character design or the faction design in this sense is uh, is so is so widespread. A play. If you're good at playing one faction, you might not even be close to uh, optimal and trying something else. So uh, I I really enjoy this game just because uh, a it's cute enough so that you could like lure someone into trying out something a bit more complex with you. But secondly, the moment you grasp the basic rules of Root, I think it's very easy for you to say like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get better at this the next time round. It's very low barrier to entry, but the skill mastery in it is is, is very, very high. Uh, so in general, a, a game like this does have elements of mind games because remember, this is a tactical strategy. Uh, forming alliances in like three to four player games also very, very important. So while it's highly strategical, I think there's a political element as well that you really want to be able to exploit. And victory does not come simple and it's never by luck. One of the things I found about this game is even with skilled players, uh, it really comes down to who made the best decisions. And I can't say that for a lot of games which involve uh, asymmetrical components. Sometimes in asymmetrical games, there is an element of like, okay, who acts first that can make a, a big difference, uh, events and chance cards. No, this one is purely on piloting your faction. So this this game, not rec- I don't recommend it for uh, trying to bring in, let's say someone who is a complete noob to tabletop games, but uh, good enough for someone who's played a little bit here and there. And that's my final pick. This is for 2018, Root. Mm. Yeah. 
route is initially my choice as one of my choices as well. Yeah, but the reason why it's not in my list is because I know one of you picked that list. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, you, 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 yes, you guessed it. You guessed yes, it. Yes, I guess root. Yeah, because okay, nice. uh, and I totally agree the point that uh, root is root has a gameplay, right? Okay, it's, it uh it is replayable because right, okay, you can get big different factions and each faction has uh, has their own ways of victory. Yeah. And one one thing I like right is if you are falling behind right okay you still have a chance you have an element alternate uh victory condition mm-hmm. yeah so this is something that I like it a lot yeah it's it's very well thought out game honestly so yeah in terms of like replayability there's you can always come back to it and have a fresh experience hmm okay so Jeffrey you didn't pick root so what do you pick <laughs> all right so my twenty eighteen pick right okay is Probably a title that not many people heard of, but it is quite well received. Okay, it's a very cute game called Raccoon Tycoon. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So, what is Raccoon Tycoon about? Okay. So, one thing I like about Raccoon Tycoon right, is the the paintings of the animals. Yeah, are very cute to a point whereby ladies will definitely be attracted by them. Yeah, and they are not like anime cute. You know, they are like really fuzzy animals. Cute paintings, you know, and they are dressed like rich, gentlemanly or ladylike tycoons, you know. So, in Raccoon Tycoon, right, each player you you will play as some you know businessman, yeah, very wealthy businessman. Okay, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to be the richest in in the entire game. Okay, so in each player's turn, you do one of one of five actions, yeah. So one of the actions we call production. You know, you play a card and then you produce. Okay, um, okay. Another action is you sell some commodity or one type of commodity. Okay, according to market value. So there is some buy low, sell high factor inside. Yeah. Um. There's another action called the railroad auction. Okay. That means you know you get to um purchase a railroad and the railroad cards right, are actually the cheaper one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so if you Google Raccoon Tycoon, right, then you understand why why these animals look very cute. Right? Yeah, alright. So, you know, you'll get to um, auction one of the railroad. Um, you can get to purchase a building. Okay. You can also get to purchase a town. Yeah, so it's very, very like a, like a property mogul type of a game. Right? Yeah, but, but, it's, but you know, they are using uh, cute animals to, to uh, as, a, as a theme. Right? Okay, so... So, uh, it is one of a very enjoyable economic game I've ever played uh, during, that, during that era. Okay, so because there's option involved, there's commodity, uh, there's no speculation in terms of commodity prices. You know, um, there are stat collection involved. Um, yeah, so basically it's a game where you you notice how the market works. It's an ever changing market. Yeah, so I sound like a business analyst, and, 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 and analysis, right? Okay, but but it is still a cute game. So thematic wise, okay, the gameplay wise, okay, it surprises me. So I'll recommend this game for my 2018 Raccoon Titan. Okay. Hey. So the last of the 2018 is my pick. And uh, this is actually kind of a genre that become more and more popular as the as the decade uh, comes to an end. And that is actually rule and write games. And I'm actually quite surprised so far, I think. 16 games in, we haven't have we haven't had a single rule and write yet. Maybe because it's more of a 2018, 2019, and even 2020 kind of kind of trend where you have more and more rule and writes. So the game that I've picked uh, is an Asian game. Uh, the game title is probably one of the cutest title you have around, and then the name of the game is Let's Make a Bus Route. Oh. <laughs> So in Let's Make a Bus Route, you actually owe, you are you you kind of each player control a bus company in the city of Kyoto and you are trying to create bus lines to ferry uh, students, elderly, tourists, commuters around the city while trying to avoid traffic jams. So each player has a board where uh, instead of it being roll and ride with dice, uh, there will be a deck of cards where, it's, where you flip colors and the, the colors actually mean different things to different players. So for example, blue card may mean moving forward straight one block. To another player, it could be moving, uh, uh, making a turn, or to a third player, it may be you have to make two turns. So in, in a way, you're kind of forced what you have to do. And 
Typically, my biggest gripes with row and write is that there's zero play interaction. You play your game, I play my game. We are just writing on our own board. But in Let's Make a Pass Route, we are sharing a board and the play interaction is there in the form that you are trying to avoid the jam because they score you penalties. I mean, obviously, if you, you are building a pass route and you actually create a jam out of it, it's going to be negative uh, uh, outlash from the public against your bus company where you have... Why do you have four bus companies going through one same route? You'll be thinking, is that, is that necessary? Especially if it's a, it's, it's, part, it's a part of the town where it's not popular or it's, you don't actually need so many buses there. So as, as a game, I, I actually enjoy it more in the sense of it being a flip and ride or row and ride but you actually do retain that player interaction and individually you actually have uh, an alternate uh, uh, or, or kind of like a bonus card where you score points based on certain criteria that you have while everybody actually has the standard criteria to meet like any row and write because you have a board that everybody can see what the objectives are and where you are heading. Yeah. So to me, if you are looking for a row and write in this day and age and you want a row and write that has player interaction yeah let's make a bus route is your game so that's my 2018 pick let's make a bus route hmm. yeah okay actually one uh one maybe fun song fun fact about uh sachi and sachi right yeah i mean they're the designers of the game right? sachi and sachi they're actually a couple it's not a single person yeah so um the husband is a game designer while the wife is the illustrator yeah so which is why right all their games uh, look the same in terms of the graphic style mm-hmm. yeah and uh, I actually bought the game directly from them. Uh, there was once they actually came to Singapore to promote their games. Uh, one is uh, Let's Make a Bus Route, the other one is the uh, In Front of Elevators. Yeah, mm-hmm. and in fact, I bought Let's Make a Bus Route from them and I got a signed copy from them as well. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, uh, and also one interesting fact about um, the couple, right, is they know how to speak Mandarin. Oh, really? They actually learn Chinese. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I met them and I don't, I don't know them. So the funny thing is, I've been to Japan last year and I bought a lot of the games from Japan. I didn't buy it from them, but mm-hmm. then I met them in Singapore after that. Uh, so the funny thing is that most people in Singapore will have a will have a signed copy of In Front of the Elevators and Let's Make a Bus Route because you probably met them maybe at Game Start or at uh, board game, uh, Asian Board Game Festival. But I have a signed copy of uh, another of their game, which suddenly has slipped my mind. It's the coffee game, uh, Blend Coffee Lab. And they're wondering how the hell they had the game because they're not selling it. I was like, oh, I've just been to Japan. I just came back from Japan. <laughs> yeah, so was the... yeah, and uh, one interesting impression from the uh, another interesting impression from the game uh, from the husband, right, the game designer, right, is uh, because I bought in front of elevators earlier, so I actually told him that I split my cards, and he kind of told me that you know uh, he he did make sure that the cards right are in top quality. So you don't need to worry about sleeping. But I explained to him that the reason why I sleep is not because I I, I worry about the, the I, I it is not because of the card quality, it's because of the quality hands from other players. <laughs> so yeah, so it doesn't matter, you know, um whether the quality of the card is good or not, because the oil will still stick. So I just want people uh, uh sleeping my card. Yeah, so 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 yeah, I have this interesting conversation about card sleeves and 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 you know quality of cards uh, with, with the game designer. I mean, speaking of them, they actually have a local, they have a collaboration with a local designer, Daryl, and mm. the game is called Remembering Our Treat. Mm. Uh, Remember Our Treat. So that game actually kind of take the best elements of uh, Let's Make a Bus Route and the best elements of Overbook, so to speak, and create a game. So I, ha- I haven't actually played the game that many times to list it in my top five. Has it not making my top five? So it's not appearing in 2019. Don't think about it. It's not there. But yeah, so. Yeah, but that, that's another game to actually look out for if you like similar concepts of of, uh, of flip and write or flip and place kind of uh, game. Mm. Okay, I think we've dwelt in 2018 longer than we needed to. <laughs> and we have deprived Matthew of speaking for the longest time and his last pick actually is in 2019. So Matthew, over to you, 2019. What's your 2019 pick? Yeah, sure. So for 2019, uh, the game is actually called The Grim Masquerade. Uh, so in the game, there are up to like eight different characters, right? And each player is assigned a character. And 
for each character, basically they either need three resources of the same type to win and two of the same type resources of another type they will lose. So, uh, I mean, just an example, just off the head, maybe Cinderella, if she gets uh, three glass slippers, she wins. If she gets two, uh, if I'm correct, candy, then she loses, right? So in the game, you know, so everybody has all their characters, right? And everybody's all um, hidden, all concealed, right? So during a player's turn, they will actually draw a card from the deck, right? And basically the deck has like eight different types of resources. So when you when you draw a card, you either can choose to give it to yourself or you can choose to give it to any of your other opponents. But for the second card, you basically have to do the opposite. So if, it, if you have given a card to somebody else, you have to take the second card. Or if you have taken the first card, you have to give the second card to anybody, right? So there are a few other things also. Um, is that once you have a pair, you need to start checking whether you are of a specific character. So let's say for example, if let's say I have two candy and there's a check for say, uh, are you a Cinderella? If you're not Cinderella, you need to take one of your evidence tokens to put uh, onto the board to say that, hey, you're not Cinderella. And then you're down to seven. So basically there's a lot of deduction elements and I, I guess the bluffing element isn't really as strong as it is, but there are certain actions you can take that tries to bait people into thinking that you are that character only for you to ah I think you're Cinderella nope you know um, another thing to also take note is that um, in the game once you have two of the same resources in your whole stack what you can actually do, choose to do is you can actually discard that pair to actually perform special actions of course uh, when you're doing that you're of course really revealing more information uh, so I think one of the key things you can do is to actually call people out. If you actually call people out, you also score points, right? Um, so as for all the, as to how you score roses is by calling other people out. If they are correct, they score. Uh, sorry, you score. But if you miss out, then the other person scores because you guess wrongly. Uh, the other way of earning roses is that uh, which are your points, is being the last player left in the game. As in, for the round. Uh, so after three rounds, uh, whoever there's most number of points or roses wins. Uh, quite lengthy because there's really quite a lot of things that needs to be explained. But once you uh, get your hands on the game and you just try it out with a group of people, uh, again, like, um, I mean, the reason why I actually recommend this game, again, is because of mind games. Um, once you start playing it, you will start to enjoy fooling around with other people in terms of like just playing mind games yeah so that's uh the green masquerade 2019 all right sticking true to his mind game genre or the games that he enjoyed the most so i think actually to be honest out of out of the whole 90s 2000 2010s how many games do you pick that are not mind games <laughs> It's okay, I'll, I'll tabulate these statistics later. <laughs> yeah. But I think I, I think a good 95%, maybe 90 to 95% are mind games. Uh, it's around there, it's around there. <laughs> around that he really enjoyed. Okay, so talking about 2019, so I have the final two picks uh, in this whole series, so I'll be rounding it off. And my two picks are actually two... Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double pick from Asia and it happens that both games are actually from Taiwan. Mm. So the first of my two pick is a game that kind of replaces another game that I really like. So there was supposed to be a game that if I had a top 10, it would have appeared and that game was Quadropolis. Because it appeared in 2016, but this game kind of replaces Quadropolis position in my heart when it came out. So the game of, the, the name of the game uh, I mean, like what Quadropolis is being a city builder, it's also a police kind of game, and the name of the game is Electropolis. So in Electropolis, uh, it's a game where you're, you're trying to uh, put tiles into a board, and for every for in the board, you start off with negative points. Every space is a negative tile. Yeah. And you are trying to put things in to actually score points. And depending on what kind of power stations you put where, it scores you different points. So because... Uh, it being Electropolis, it's all about generating power and 
the, the element that I really like about this game, I'm not going to dwell so much about what this game, uh, the gameplay is, because I'm sure you can read the rules, and uh, I, I'll just be telling you what I really like about this game, is that it's one of, it, it started kind of like a trend or a, 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 a team in Taiwan specifically, where they try to make board games that are related to the environment. Because the, the there is one negative counter uh, where it actually records your pollutions that you actually create in the kind of like in the environment. So most games you play where there are city builders, you don't actually think of the negative effect of what your what you're placing in affects the environment. But this is one of the first few games that at least games that I played off that actually had this as a team that they actually want to encourage and they talk about it. And given that they are all power generators, whether it's nuclear power, coal, burning of coal to get power, or you actually have some green plants, you are actually looking, trying to look after the environment at the same time as you trying to win. So in, in a way, at the end of the game, if let's say your points actually reach a, a stage where you have too many negative points or you, your, your pollution track is too far ahead, you will still lose the game or you will still not get that far in terms of the point tracker against other people that play with you. So one other element that I really like uh, about this game is how you actually pick who to go first in a round. Because it actually took elements of another game that I really enjoy, which is Five Tribes, in terms of you trying to kind of beat for where you're going. And being at different locations actually affects uh, what kind of tiles you can take in. Because the tiles are actually just scattered around uh, this uh, kind of the starting uh, beating tracker and you actually collect tiles adjacent to each other. So when someone actually takes tiles away, the tiles actually join up. Which means that tiles that you originally wanted to take that were not together, could be together by the time you take it. So that kind of is a very interesting concept that I, at least to me, I, I, I haven't seen many games do that. Yeah, And that together with the fact that it's, it's one of the few board games that think about the environment. I mean, even though the, our hobby is all about creating more plastics and creating more cardboards and creating more papers. But yeah, uh, it's, it's, really a, it's really a game that actually strikes me into my heart and it's a city builder and it's a kind of game that I really like. So the first of my two picks, Electropolis. So the second game, uh, it's I think I kind of cheated a little bit because the original version of this game I mean, it came out in 2015, so technically it's still in the same video space because we're talking about 2015 to 2019. And uh, the name of this game is Star Out Chen, second edition where it came out in 2019 because the game is actually different versus the first edition. So in this, uh, in Star Out Chen, you are actually a uh, trader. You are trying to actually uh, become the most prestigious trader uh, of Star Out Chen. And what you are actually doing is flipping these various discs that you actually have in this uh, huge game board where you are trying to actually match up and collect uh, tokens or you're actually trying to collect resource uh, so that you can actually place it in your own player board. So in a way, it's, it's a very... Uh, it's, it's a game where you are kind of solo in terms of what you're doing and where all your player interaction coming is in that central board because what you are actually doing will affect the next player when the player actually flips down. Yeah, and you, the thing I really like about it is because you will spend, I won't say hours, but you'll spend a lot of time staring at the tile board to try to find combos to make it happen. Uh, so, uh, if you if you were to liken it to something like Bejeweled, maybe where you're actually trying to connect things, and then when things fall into place, they they actually combo with each other, and you clear different things at the same time. You can do that with that option. Yeah, because the, the tiles where you actually flip here, then suddenly it connects another colour because an uh, opposing side of a tile is not the same colour, it's a different colour. So you can potentially get a match from something else. Something else, when you when it matches, it flips and then it actually matches with something else yet again. So after that, when you get the resource, you actually start to play in your player board and that's where uh, kind of all the magic happens, uh, where you are doing that simultaneously because so much time in the game is allocated to that flipping and so much time is wasted because if you play with players with uh, with uh, analysis paralysis, the game will go on forever. But if you actually play with players who are trying to take it as it goes, the game can actually end within an hour. Yeah, and uh, so that's my second 2019 pick, uh, Tadao Cheng Second Edition. And if you are interested to find out a bit more about this game, I actually did a video 
of solo gameplay for Tao Chen. And to be honest, for Asian games, I think solo gameplay is not a very common uh, thing that that is, is actually introduced because I think to most Asians, you want to play games with friends and they create games that way. So to have a solo game in Asian, it was kind of one of the first few. Yeah, so if you haven't uh, seen the game or you haven't heard of the game, yeah, you should definitely uh, check it out. Uh, the name of the game is Star Ocean Second Edition. Don't get the wrong one. Yeah, and we've come to the end of the era with no crossover. Yeah, it's a very rich era. Let's be let's be very like to be very fair. The de- the decade was amazing for like board games and modern development for tabletop. So. I, I, I don't think I'm super surprised that we had, you know, that we didn't have any overlap. But uh, it really goes to show that there were so many good titles for a lot of people that came out this decade. Yeah, in fact, there are some games I like to point out, right, that I didn't choose because I thought you, one of you guys might pick them. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe I'll just, I'll just list, uh, quickly list a few... Honourable mentions. Yes, honourable mentions. Honorable mentions okay. yeah. One, right, is Gloomhaven. I thought one of you might, might mention Gloomhaven. Okay, the other one is a uh, wingspan. I thought that one of you might talk about, uh, might talk about wingspan. Yeah, and uh, be, uh, I actually also also suspect that one of you might also pick Ethnos. Ah, mm. right, 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 yes. right. Yeah. So other than that, uh, I almost picked King Domino because I know one of you picked King Domino, which I <laughs> guess correctly. Yeah, and yeah, and I actually guess Root. <laughs> so, yes, Root. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that game so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I had a few honorable mentions as well. I think stuff that which really didn't fit on the list just because of you know the other stuff that we're recommending already. Mm. Uh, I personally like Sagrada a lot. You know, it's a it's it's the same year that it came up for that as Azul. Uh, both of them very pretty to look at because you know you're you're really like building up uh, like a, a little masterpiece in front of you. But then of course it has all these like dice elements and the fact that I thought about too many bones already has all these unique dice. I didn't want to like have that like crossover. Um, in fact, I, I compared to what I normally do, right? Like the other very heavy game that I like from the past five years is this thing called uh, Spirit Island. Uh, this one is. Yeah, it's also very, it's very beautiful. I think the thematics of it were just excellent because you're playing the environment, you're playing like spirits of an island and you're getting humans out of here because you know, they're destroying everything that's secret about, about our world. Uh, very heavy game though. So uh, go watch uh, how to play on it first before deciding whether or not, just because it's pretty, uh, that you want to get into it. Yeah. If I were to pick an Asian game, so I mean, so far, although I have Yonko Hama, if I pick another Asian game, my that would be Tulip Bubble, which I have also mentioned. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, Tulip it's Bubble really is a good, good game, which I actually uh, I actually flew to Osaka to get it. Wow, okay. Sick. Yeah. Actually, I think honorable mentions for me would be the uh, Century series. Mm. Yeah. To me, to be honest, if you ask me between Century Spice Roots and Splendor, most people will take them as substitutes. Mm. To me, it kind of are different games. Mm. Even though the, the, the concept of it doesn't seem too dissimilar. But mm. one, you actually change cubes or you change spices from one to another. And the other one, they're kind of what it is. You can't change them to other things other than the one. Mm. So to me, uh, Century, the Century series was the uh, was a honorable mention. Other than that, I already mentioned about uh, Quadrupolis. Uh, I was close to actually picking Moonbase. Oh, um, Moonbase is pretty because it's a it's 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 a it's an interesting abstract game. I bought the game, and then when I first played, I was mind blown. Mm-hmm. But the problem is because it, it only plays two, so I, I didn't actually have a lot of opportunities to play yep. that with many people. Yeah, mm-hmm. So uh, it, it kind of fall down the list. Uh, yeah. One other game that uh, I thought one of you may pick was Tilti Huacan. For the fact of what you can do with dice, yeah, Tilti Huacan is, is also a game that I, I really enjoy a lot, but uh, haven't played enough to make the list. Right. Yeah, and I think other than other than those that I mentioned earlier, of course there were games that I already mentioned before, like Point Salad, but in in a way, spot I don't know for choice, uh. Yeah, we're yeah, really spot for choice. We are really spot for choice in this yeah. in, in these five years where there are really so many, so many games. And yeah. I thought one of you would have picked uh, Scythe. Sky- yeah, I, I think I think yeah, Scythe is like a. I mean, for heavy, that's why you know, like usually Jeffrey like picks yeah. pretty heavy games. 
I, I would imagine that Skyth is on the list, but uh, and Wingspan also, like I thought one of these few games would be like on our list, but surprisingly, yeah. I guess because they're very mainstream also, la, in terms of like how good they are. And for this series, we really wanted to talk about our favorite top fives that yeah. we could recommend to others that might not be so popularly known. Yeah. The reason why I picked Skype, right, because compared to my other game choices, right, uh, it does it tries to sell itself as a war game, but it doesn't mm. the gameplay doesn't It doesn't play like a war game, yeah. That's yes. true. Yeah, that's so true. which is why which is why uh, I mean I, I enjoy Skype a lot, yeah. But uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean probably that's the reason why I didn't put it in my top five, yeah, yeah. compared to my other game. Yeah, I mean compared to something like Root, for example, I see Root as more war game ish than something yes. like Scythe for me, you know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, other than those, one other game that I, I really enjoy and I didn't manage to put it in is the Grizzle. Mm. For the fact of the... Th- I think it's one of the few games where it actually shows me that cuts... I mean, cut being counted as life is not, it's not, it's not a new game. But the fact that you really feel that demoralized when you play the game because <laughs> you're going through war, every one of us feels it when we play the game. So it, it, it's, it's that interesting where you actually really go into a war mode and you're trying to just get through the war and you're like feeling down, feeling like you see your morale really dropping. Like the, it literally drops the morale of the table when you see the cards dropping. <laughs> I mean, to me it's, yeah. If, if you actually have a game that can do that to all the players in the table, it'll be a very good game. Yeah. yeah so Grizzled was, was one of the few that I really liked and, and if I had top 10, it would have made the least. Matthew, you have any yourself that you almost made the list? That almost made your list? Actually, I was struggling with my list to <laughs> even get five. Because the genre of my kind of games, I, I, I think it basically went down, man. And uh, I, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good problem, my own opinion, right? Mm-hmm. Where people who love to play like mind gamish games are now starting to appreciate higher strategy level each games uh, so that's why you know you guys are spot for choice whereas for me I'm like okay I'm looking for you know party friendly ish and the mind gamey ish I'm like I think in yeah. a way for the, for the games that you enjoy right in, in these five years a lot of the games actually remade itself kind oh of, okay like, things they probably like, had, yeah I mean like all social deduction game actually be a lot of a lot of the old social deduction game actually remade and actually like real mm. Real words, uh, even games like Avalon, they kind of re re emerge itself. I don't know, man, to the right, 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 right. Um, mm-hmm. and showing itself yet the game that it's still holding its holding mm-hmm. its position. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, staying true to the essence of you know this whole uh, uh, Zoom recording. You know, I I try <laughs> to get like original titles that were created in the years twenty fifteen to twenty nineteen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Solid, solid. I think it was a good list. This this one was really a, a very good recap of what uh, I think people were playing in the past five years and stuff that we can... Thankfully, the things that we're recommending, you can still get a hold of them because not all of them are out of print. In fact, I think most of our games are still circulating uh, at some way, in some way, shape or form, you know, compared to, let's say, talk about stuff in the 90s, right? That one might be just a little bit out of reach. Right? Mm-hmm. Actually, I, I was quite surprised for, for Matthew. He didn't pick real words. I thought there was real words uh. Uh, I, I would attribute it as more like a uh, uh, I don't know like a English language games because you're dealing with <laughs> words right so yeah English language game okay <laughs> yeah okay so so yeah that was okay cool so for Jeffrey and Matthew if I'm going to make you list out like the top 3 games of all time will you pick from this 20 games from these four videos that you have made? I, I mean, for, personally for me, my top five is already <laughs> pretty much the top three. I, <laughs> I will rather, I will rather compete, like, I'll say, uh, the next few videos probably come up with something else already. Uh. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pick the same no, I'm, I'm not going to come up with top five games of all time. Uh. I'm, I'm not going to make you do that video, man. It's, it's, it's going to be a... It's going to be like a copy and paste idea. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I, I mean, if you notice, right, how, how I space center Maria, I like, I like, I like, 
shall I explain again? <laughs> you know, yeah. So so yeah. Then I think I also mentioned again quite a number of times already. Yeah. So 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 yeah. So I think also try to avoid something that is very copy and paste. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, in in a way, to be honest, when we when we first created this series, it was purely attributed to COVID and yeah, I understand. To meet people. So to be honest, content was at its minimal. So I I really respect the guys from from Dice Tower who can come up with top 10 videos of so many different type of genre and the fact that most of their games are not repeated it also it also, it also shows what what repertoire of games they've played like. mm. 5 or 6 or 7 thousand games that they've played maybe once or twice and then they pick this thing some of those maybe mm. I can suggest like one next topic right maybe it's like you know uh, for example uh, top 5 games where you have no expectation but turn out good <laughs> actually, that's that's actually very good. Like for us, we've we've played our fair share of like games across time, and there are times where we really, you know, it sounds really boring and bland, but then you end up having like multiple play sessions of it. So mm. I, I've I've uh, definitely uh, had those experiences. Yeah. So sometimes I uh, we list out we list out title right? Like, yeah. I, I mean we list out suggestions. Sometimes uh, you know we can come up with with different. Different games, lah. Yeah, you know, it mm-hmm. not necessarily be our top five. I mean, our top, our top favorite games, lah. But there are be some games that they really surprise you, one. No? Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Number, yeah. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, then also you know come up with something that is more team, lah. So maybe you can say that like, maybe uh top games that 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 in that that involves food, top games that involves animals, top games involves cars, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, <laughs> etc. Yeah, something like that, lah. Yeah. I mean, definitely we can we, we will be thinking of more ideas uh, for top 5 and if you have any ideas uh, do leave it in the comments below if you want to see Jeffrey's recommendation of top 5 games that you have no expectation and turn out good if we have one comment on this we will make the video happen <laughs> so I'm openly inviting Jeffrey to comment himself let's see if he does that no, I'm not going to comment myself. Yeah. <laughs> any, any viewers they will do it. You know? yeah, actually, I don't really expect you to go and put this in, <laughs> in the video. <laughs> yeah. So, what are some games that came out in the second half of 2010 that you really enjoy? Please do share with us uh, in the comments below. If you enjoy videos like this top 5 series, uh, do also comment below to share with us what are other top 5 uh, videos that you like to see. I mean, Jeffrey have just mentioned a few moments ago, maybe thinking about teams or food or I don't know, animals or cars. Yeah, if you have any ideas, do share it with us because we will greatly want to do what you actually want to watch. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to us, the subscribe button is right there at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Do click it. Do share these videos uh, with your friends who actually enjoy uh, watching or trying to find out more games that are out there. Because to be honest, a lot of the times we'll be actually making these videos, we actually learn about some board games that we probably wouldn't encounter in our own circle. Yeah. Whereas crossing ideas like that, we actually gain more out of it as well. Yeah. Do give this video a like if you really enjoyed it. And more of our videos are at the site. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.